CH2. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Haynes. Tonight on Greater Boston, what does Rachel Rollins' abrupt exit as U.S. attorney mean for other women of color looking to break the same kind of barriers she did? Then, allergy season is upon us. We all know that. And if you feel like your symptoms are worse than ever, you are not alone. Two allergy experts join me on what's making this year unbearable for so many and what we can do about it. Before Rachel Rollins was forced to resign as U.S. attorney over the damning results of two separate federal ethics investigations, she was a powerful champion of progressive criminal justice reform. She was also repeatedly breaking barriers, becoming the first black woman to ever serve as U.S. attorney for Massachusetts and the first black woman to serve as district attorney anywhere in the state. Her election came on the heels of nationwide efforts to elect more women, especially more women of color, into public office. And now, in the wake of her scandal, what is next for the progressive policies that she fought for and the politicians and the public servants that she fought to work alongside? It's a question many have been asking in recent weeks. And the answer? Well, it's complicated, as State Senator Lydia Edwards acknowledges in an op-ed for the Boston Globe, writing, quote, the system Rollins pushed against is all too eager to close in. And it is too easy for us to, in condemning recent actions, throw away a legacy of justice reform that must be preserved. Well, Senator Lydia Edwards joins me now. Thank you so much for the time. Absolutely, and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, I think um, a lot of folks who were watching uh, this rise of, of Rachel Rollins um, were were had many mixed emotions about it. And you write in your um, in your op-ed in your piece there in the in the Globe about this. What made you want to put pen to paper to talk about this issue? Um, I mean, I was. Deeply pained, I, I think in general, when I heard about the fundraising issue and uh, the potential that she would be re resigning, I, it was it was a gut punch because of what Rachel means to so many of us, not just as an individual, but her leadership, her ability to uh, be the U.S. attorney as the first black woman. Uh, as I mentioned in my op-ed, I've known her since I was a baby attorney before I was in politics. So... And then the vitriol and the response uh, to her, um, the pile on, as I called it, was constant. And it didn't, it wasn't fair. It didn't speak to the entirety of Rachel and her legacy. And I did not want in any way, shape or form her mistakes to be um, her only legacy. She made mistakes, but she did a lot of good. And it's worth us acknowledging that. I think she was trying to do a lot of things, and you mentioned that in the piece that you wrote, including not prosecuting minor offenses, um, including pushing more progressive stances in law enforcement at a time where the country was crying for it. What happens now in that law enforcement system when someone who was championing those ideals that was such a high profile figure is now resigned and, and, and gone from that position? Well, another thing I mentioned is that we stop um, making movements about individuals mm -hmm. and really about the goals of those um, of the policies and the people that they're going to impact for generations. You know, that is what we need to do. We're, we're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. People, as I mentioned, they pass away. They change their mind. Uh, they make mistakes. And ultimately, they're individuality should not stop the goals or the essence of the movement that they started or that they're a part of and helping to amplify. Uh, if, if you really feel it, truly that uh, criminal justice reform is necessary, then you believe that regardless of who is at the helm and you should be fighting for it. You should be fighting for a just criminal justice system uh, where you know the, the racial disparities do not exist, where people are safer, um, when police are around, uh, where people truly believe that their income does not determine the outcome of their trials, these are things that are worth fighting for regardless of who is at the helm.
I'm thoughtful of even uh, Rachel Rollins's race for district attorney of Suffolk County. And then, of course, this appointment as U.S. attorney and the other side saying that these policies push too far. They are too progressive for the state of Massachusetts. Does this then get to be an I told you so moment for folks who believes that and that it then brings brings it back many more steps from before she won those elections? Yeah, there are many people who would like to combine the two that I told you so about the individual uh, Ms. Rollins, and therefore that means the policies or the um, the I think some people are calling them as woke policies or these progressive policies or anti they call them anti police policies are therefore um, a non-starter and therefore are not working. But the statistics demonstrate that they are working, that they did work, that we that in, in not prosecuting. Um, these these petty crimes, we actually had a lower recidivism rate. When we prioritize the health and wellness of people who are suffering from addiction versus punishing them for the actions that they took, we actually were seeing people get healthier and our neighborhoods get safer. So the, the reality is facts matter. The reality is um, we need to we need to really make policies based off of, again, uh, your your goals of reforming our criminal justice system, keeping our neighborhoods safe and re eliminating racial disparities. And those policies that Rachel pushed for do do those things. And if, again, Rachel's imperfections and mistakes that she made, which no one is denying them, I am not denying them, mm. um, they are not part of that conversation as to whether we need criminal justice reform or not. They are two different conversations. How she is held accountable has nothing to do with whether we should be ending these programs. I'm also thoughtful of the organizations that sort of help wrap around community organizers, women of color who are looking into going into politics. How does it hurt that effort? Um, if those individuals who want to wrap it all into one uh, moment saying the mistakes of one individual, one woman, one black woman, uh, means that the rest of you will be making mistakes and will hold you to a higher standard. That is an intent that's based off of their own bigotry that they had before that. Mm. But to those individuals, uh, Lydia Edwards speaking to you as a woman, person of color, black woman specifically, run. Run like your life depends on it. Run with your heart wide open. Run because we need your voices and your perspectives are vital to whether we're going to have a more just society. You do not, you are not the mistakes of any other individual. You are not the mistakes or the imperfections of other people that come before you. You are your own person and your voice is going to be one that highlights so many realities that are not talked about enough. I say to you, run louder, run prouder, be yourself even more so. Actually, that'll help you distinguish yourself from everybody else. And I, I am proud to be who I am and where I come from. And I don't, I don't believe that uh, my work, my essence, my heart is going to be by the be judged um, by someone else's mistakes um, by the right people or by the voting population. Uh, voters, voters, <laughs> they do care. They mm. do know. And they do do the research. The Biden administration is going to have to make another appointment here. Feels like the election season has already started, and we're seeing that. Um, do you think that? It, you know, if you had a crystal ball or if you were in the White House having that conversation with the Biden administration on this, do you think that they're going to go with someone more conservative when it comes to uh, legal standpoints, policies and things like that? I hope not. I, I hope that they, again, don't play into the, the policies not working because the person was imperfect, imperfect. I hope that they really understand those policies are still very popular today, that many people benefited them. They're alive today because of those policies. People are free today because of those policies. And if he, if, if he believes in rolling back those policies, if he picks a more conservative person, to me, what he is saying is I don't, I am rolling back attempts at criminal justice reform. We're going to have to be watching it closely. Senator Lydia Edwards, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Up next, there has been no shortage of warm weather this year, but the higher temperatures have come with a cost, a longer and stronger pollen season. For many who suffer from seasonal allergies like myself, symptoms have been worse than ever. And even people who don't usually have much of a problem during pollen season, well, they have started to feel its effects. So what does the rest of the spring have in store and how can any of us fight the worsening symptoms? Well. 
We're hoping to get some answers here today. I'm joined by Kenneth Mendez, President and CEO of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation, and Dr. Anna Wolfson, Allergist and Immunologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Thanks for joining us. Great, Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so Dr. Wolfson, I'm gonna ask you, what are you seeing in your office uh, nowadays? Because it seems like everyone I know is talking about sneezing and sniffling and everything in between. Yeah, exactly as you've said, we've seen so many patients with runny noses, congestion, itchy eyes, and flares of their asthma. It's been a really rough pollen season this year so far. So is this something that you gear up for, like seeing the forecast or seeing some of these trends here, and you're, you're, you're thoughtful about that in your office and in your practice there? Yes, absolutely. As the pollen season comes, we add in more clinics, more shots, uh, slots for patients, and also we anticipate that more patients will be seeking out our advice and our care. We also realize people will be calling with more questions, so we have nurses available to answer their calls and their messages. We know especially our asthma patients often have many questions for us. Well, speaking of that, that uh, you know, Kenneth, I, I'm thoughtful of this as well. I have asthma, and every time my allergies kick up, my asthma kicks up as well. And that can be a real, a real concern for folks who are just trying to find some relief somewhere. Yeah, you know, there's something called allergic asthma, which can be a tri trigger, which allergies, seasonal allergies, can be a trigger for that allergic asthma. And what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, over 3,100 people die each year from asthma. So it's really important to see someone like Dr. Wolfson. We always recommend see a specialist so you understand what your triggers are for your asthma and you can uh, deal with that. And in the spring allergy season, the, the allergy season throughout the year can be a trigger for that for certain types of asthma. We've found that the allergy seasons are getting longer and more intense and um, the pollen releases are more intense because the additional carbon dioxide from uh, climate change. So that supercharges these releases. And then if you're in an urban area in particular, there are these urban heat islands where the average temperature is close to four degrees more than outside the urban areas. So it's a lot worse for people in urban areas as well. Well, I was gonna ask you, cause we were looking into some information and found that you know a lot of the major Massachusetts cities actually see an uptick in these cases of allergy and asthma over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely Dr. Wolfson would know that. She just spoke about that. But we do a report uh, called Allergy Capitals. We look at the 100 largest cities and the ones that are most challenging to live in with allergies. And there are three criteria that we use. Pollen counts, access to specialists like Dr. Uh, Wolfson, and then over-the-counter medication. So your rank in there will be based on your access. Now, actually, Boston ranks quite high in terms of access to specialists, so that's good. But in other places, uh, you know, there are higher pollen counts, uh, either tree pollen uh, or over-the-counter medication usage. So that's why the, some of the rankings fluctuate each year. Dr. Wolfson, how does this year compare to perhaps years past? It is much worse this year. Both um, anecdotally, we've seen our patients really suffering, asking lots of questions about what to do when they have very um, you know, itchy eyes, runny noses, congestion, and asthma symptoms. Um, and we only anticipate this continuing on into the future. Once the symptoms begin, they really kind of um, carry on and build on themselves. So this is something we need to prepare for this season on going into the future. I'm also thoughtful of, we mentioned folks who may not have experienced allergies in, in years past and this season was particularly bad for them. What if folks are concerned that it may not just be allergies, maybe it's COVID, maybe it's another infection. And I know that sometimes folks get concerned when they start sniffing and sneezing and they don't normally do, that it might be, might be something very serious. Of course, fever is not a symptom we would expect okay. with allergies, so that would be a sign. And of course, taking a COVID test would be the first step. Um, but if you're confused, unsure, seeing your primary care doctor and even an allergist can be really helpful to discern these different symptoms. I'm also, I mean, it, yeah, go ahead. I, I would just add one other um, slightly different angle, but the doctor can confirm this. I think with allergies, it's your total allergic load in your system. So a lot of people are coming and saying, 
they've never had allergies before or their allergies feel a lot worse. And I think because they're more there's more pollen release and you have these longer, more intense seasons, if you never had allergies before, because of the additional pollen and these allergens, you're now starting to react because your body has started to reach that threshold. So per what Dr. Wilson was saying, that's why some people are, are feeling these symptoms and maybe they never had them before. How do we, uh, well, first, let me ask you this, because I know that albuterol has been in short supply in the last season as we went in from winter and now we're in spring and we're still having a hard time, you know, uh, with the stocks and stockpile and things like that. I mean, as we think about more folks maybe having an asthma flare up or things like that, is there a concern that there may be a shortage of medication to treat any sort of acute symptoms? This is absolutely a concern and we're monitoring it very closely. We really wanna guard against you know, a hoarding situation, but also making sure our patients have the medications that they need. Um, there are good alternatives. So something to speak to your physician, whether it's your allergist, your pulmonologist, your primary care doctor to see if you're a candidate for that. Um, and hopefully the factories will be able to keep up and keep up with the supply dem demands going into the future as well. And, and I think that that shortage has been for primarily what we've seen or we, we've heard is uh, the nebulized albuterol that they use in, in a hospital setting. We haven't quite heard, we, we will usually hear in our community, but the, we're a national organization, we're not you know local, but, but we'll, we'll usually hear about shortages and, and we're in touch with like the pharmacy association that really understand where these shortages might be, but what we've heard and seen is, is primarily the nebulized, um, which is, uh, you know, the liquid form. But I think the doctor's absolutely right. We don't want to board anything. We want to make sure people understand what it is. And I think if you use, I'm pretty sure if you use a, a spacer, you know, a, a chamber, an air chamber with um, uh, an inhaler sprayed al albuterol rescue medication into that chamber, that can work as an alternative, which is I think what the doctor was alluding to maybe. Yeah, so it's important to emphasize that the nebulizer does not necessarily work better than the inhaled version of albuterol via the um, inhaler with the spacer. So it can be a very good substitute. But with young children, young children may not do as well with using the pump and the spacer, correct? Absolutely, and that's really tough, especially for the really small kids. And so this is where maybe alternative nebulized medications could come into play. Or, I mean, at least trying the inhaler, you'd be surprised. Some kids are more adaptable than you give them credit for. So what's the best way? If I'm at home and, I, and I'm concerned about this, I might be feeling like this is, this is really an unbearable season, right? So Dr. Wolfson, I mean, what should I be doing at home to prepare myself for things getting worse or to continue to treat? Uh, if I don't necessarily want to, you know, wait for a doctor's appointment, is there anything I can do at home to, to help myself? So there are definitely some lifestyle modifications you can make. The first is actually shutting the windows. I know it's nice outside, but actually keeping that pollen outside and using the air conditioning instead. Um, you also can physically remove pollen from your hair and your skin if you go outside. So taking a shower after you've been outside. And you can use, you know, there are some over-the-counter medications. Of course, ask your doctor if it's okay for you to use those. But there are some very effective medications available over-the-counter, such as, you know, oral antihistamines and steroid nasal sprays that can really help patients. Yeah. Well, I also want to, um, Mr. Mendez, talk about the the climate change conversation, because as we try to work on solutions as a nation for what that looks like, I mean, it's possible that we have to continue to sort of brace ourselves for what could even be a drier and more highly pollinated season. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because people think about climate change, they think about sea level rise, and some people who aren't on the coastline or don't spend time there might not see the impact of, of climate change. But what we tell people is, you know, there's a direct link here. If your allergies are getting worse, it's because of climate change, the longer growing seasons, the more intense releases of pollen. And I'll just give you an example of how that works. So the first um, growing season starts in the springtime with pollen releases from trees. But because it's a lot warmer, that growing season starts sooner. So that's how it starts much earlier. 
Then uh, from the trees, you move to the summer where you have grass pollen. And then towards the fall, you have ragweed, which is the fall aller allergen. But that fall allergen continues a lot longer because it's warmer in the fall. Usually the first frost kills the ragweed so they can't pollinate anymore. But because it's much warmer than the growing season continues, and then you have more intense releases of pollen because of the carbon dioxide. And it's known that carbon dioxide supercharges the release of, of pollen uh, from, from plants. So that's how you get more intense releases. And that's the link between climate change and allergies in, in our health. And so we, you know, in addition to the things you can do to manage your pollen in your hair and the other things, I mean, it's a bigger picture issue where reducing your carbon footprint, being mindful of that is really important as it impacts climate change. Yeah, would you also agree with that, uh, Dr. Wolfson? Yes, very well stated. And also just to say that pollution can worsen asthma itself. Yes. So, you know, direct link there as well. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you both for your time. Kenneth Mendez is president and CEO of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation. And Dr. Anna Wolfson is an allergist and immuno, uh, immunologist rather, at Massachusetts General Hospital. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Crystal Haynes. Good night. I'm deep in the Lynn Woods, inside the belly of the beast, Dungeon Rock. Some say that this place is seriously haunted. Do you worry that it's actually haunted? For sure, yes, absolutely. Others that it hides the treasure of 17th century pirate Thomas Veal. He's in the cave, the treasure's in the cave, and he's smashed flat. So this rock becomes his dungeon. One thing that is certain, it was dug by a man who believed he was being led right here from beyond the grave. So there is a supposedly haunted cave here in Lynn. We're gonna get to the bottom of this spooky story and our quest begins right here. I grew up not too far from the woods. We definitely learned about Dungeon Rock as kids, for sure. It's a pretty cool and compelling story. In the mid 1800s, the woods entered an ominous chapter, becoming a hotbed of the paranormal. Thanks to a Massachusetts man named Hiram Marble, a member of a social religious movement called spiritualism. They had mediums that believed that they could speak to people that have passed on, um, and so Hiram Marble would use these mediums. Marble purchased the land in Lid Woods because he believed he was being led there by one spirit in particular, the ghost of a pirate from the 1600s named Thomas Veal. Stories have it that there was a pirate who ended up taking up shop there, um, hiding with his treasure. An earthquake happened and he was sealed in the cave with the treasure, allegedly. The pirate story first appeared in print nearly two centuries after it supposedly happened. And soon, versions began popping up all over. And it was against this backdrop that Hiram Marble and his son Edwin would spend 30 years relentlessly digging a cave in search of the remains of Thomas Veal and his buried treasure. A cave still there today, Dungeon Rock. Would you be interested in joining me for a little trip to the pirate cave. There are a lot of people who still go to Dungeon Rock. I'm just not one of them. Wait, you've never been inside? No. Why? It, it, it creeps me out a little bit. Do you worry that it's actually haunted? Like, do you? Yeah, for sure. 
For, for sure. sure. Yes, absolutely. I don't need to encounter that spirit. At the edge of the woods, today a 2,200 acre park, we met up with Ranger Dan Small, our guide into the heart of Hiram Marble's unholy obsession. There was no turning back now. There are people who won't go in. At one time, oh, 20 years ago, I had an assistant ranger, and he was a rugged guy. He was like a regular guy, but he would not go in there. As the original story goes, one night in 1658, a mysterious ship appeared in the bay. Four men, including Thomas Veal, were seen rowing from it up the Saugus River. They took up residency in the woods. And he had the treasure with him, which is the important part. Three of the pirates were captured by authorities, but Thomas Veal escaped. He ran up into here with the treasure. Behind this big rock that you're standing next to, there's actually a natural cave. And there he lived for a time, until a great earthquake struck and collapsed his makeshift abode. That's why it's called Dungeon Rock. This is the pirate's dungeon, because a big boulder has him trapped underneath it. As for the veracity of this old yarn, yeah. Well, there were pirates in this area at that time. There really was a guy named Tom Veal. There's records of him in the Salem court. But while there are first-hand records of earthquakes here in 1638 and 1663, there wasn't one in 1658. Another major fault with the story, too, is nowhere before about 1850 or 1840 is there any reference to this area being called Dungeon Rock. True or not, Hiram Marble wholeheartedly believed the tale. As for people today... I found ritually killed chickens. I found things with candles and coconut and all sorts of things that were set up. It's easy to dismiss it all as, as a hoax or hooey, but the reality is a lot of people still believe that there's something going on up here, and who am I to say there isn't? Out of excuses and reasons to stall, it was time to enter this literal underworld. Inside, it is cold, it is damp, and it is dark. The tunnel is erratic. They actually would hold seances in the cave. The ghost would appear and he would say, go right, go left. And that's why it makes these abrupt changes. And it abruptly ends, 174 feet from the start, with two stagnant pools of water. We got a trusty ghost meter here. It runs on a nine volt battery, so I'm not sure how much of a ghost meter it can really be, but we're gonna turn it on and see what we find here at the end of the cave. The needle seems to be doing absolutely nothing in any direction. Oh, little bounce here. Hello? What, honestly, what, what the, the f was that? Hello? Hello? Turns out it was just some kids messing with us. <laughs> like, for, like that was legitimately for a moment terrifying. In the end, there were no ghosts, there was no gold. A disappointment I think the marbles might relate to. Hiram passed away in 1868. Edwin kept digging until his death in 1880 and is buried in an unmarked grave just steps from the cave's entrance. They didn't find the treasure either, but in a way, they did get what they were looking for. Edwin and Hiram's plan from the start, and they made this very public, was that if they ever found the money, they were gonna buy all this land around here and they were gonna turn it into a park for the people in Lynn. Today, it is exactly that, and their man-made cave at Dungeon Rock is free and open to the public whenever the weather allows. So yes, you can come and see it for yourself, if you dare. The Curiosity Desk is sponsored by Emerson College, inspiring curiosity and creative expression in all of us.